various actions and events call for a specific response. We know that. Uh, we see that in almost every aspect of our, of our lives. Uh, when the traffic light turns red, we know that we're expected to stop. Uh, when it's green, we go. When there's a yellow, we go a little faster. Um, but we know how it, how it operates. This, this past week, Janelle and I were, uh, made a quick trip up to, to Red Deer to meet with Earl Marshall. He's the executive director of, of GCC Canada. Uh, uh, we were going there to have dinner with Earl and his wife Brenda, and then there was a couple other of the GCC pastors and their wives that we were meeting uh, during that time uh, as well. But as we were making our way up, as we shortly or as we had just passed by the town of Troshu, I noticed serendipitously uh, the telltale sign of some red and blue lights. It was a white, uh, a white SUV that was fast approaching on my tail. Uh, the siren was not on, but there were the lights flashing and going. I don't know why this happened, but for some reason, my lovely passenger uh, lifted her elbow onto the console to see the speedometer, only to slump back and say, oh, no. <laughs> I, like every good law-abiding citizen, slowed down, pulled onto the shoulder, as I did so, the RCMP continued to pass by. They were moving at pace. And as they continued down that, that road and growing smaller and smaller with, with every passing second, uh, I noticed other cars were just doing the same. Each of them was pulling over to the side. I'm sure their hearts were racing as ours were. Uh, we were quite content uh, that the constable had other issues, pressing issues to attend to. But we had done what was expected. What do you do when a king makes himself known? What is, the ex what is expected of those who hear his powerful words and see his awe-inspiring works? How are we to respond when the Lord of glory commands us to follow him regardless of the course or the cost or, or the circumstances in which we find ourselves? Well, as we look at the Gospel of Matthew this morning, the writer is going to answer these questions by offering us three pictures or, or three examples of that which must be avoided. Matthew chapter 8, verses 18 to 22, we will see that Jesus is a king who commands our allegiance. Jesus is a king who commands our allegiance, possessing all authority in heaven and on earth. He is a king who calls us to follow him. We are to do so without hesitation or reservation, we are to follow him with no strings attached whatsoever. If you haven't already done so, open your Bibles to, once again to the Gospel of Matthew. And we're going to look at the text together. You'll remember that it begins in verses 1 through 17 with, with Jesus presenting three different sets of miracles. He attends to a leper. He attends to the servant of a Roman centurion. Uh, he will meet the needs of Peter's mother-in-law. Uh, Matthew does this to show us that Christ's power is perfect, uh, that it extends to all people in all places, uh, that it cannot be bound by distance, that he is one who ministers to Jews and to Gentiles, to men and to women. One who cares for the high and the lowly, for friends and for enemies, for the despised and the distinguished. 
But now as we come to verse 18, Jesus will present us with three small snapshots of the people's response to that particular ministry. And, and they are negative pictures. They are examples of what we must not do. But in saying this, I want you to recognize that this pattern is actually going to be repeated in, in Matthew's gospel at least two more times. Two more times we're going to see three sets of miracles performed, and two more times we're going to witness the response of the Jews. Matthew is making it clear in this section that Jesus is not a king that you can simply trifle with. He's not a monarch in name only. He's not a king that you can kind of tip your hat to and then just go on your merry way. No, Jesus is a king who commands our allegiance. He expects it, and he demands it. We'll see that as we look into God's word this morning. So with that in mind, let's stand for the reading of the text. We'll begin at Matthew chapter 8, verse 18, and continue reading to the end of verse 22. So this is the word of the Lord. This is his inspired Inerrant word, this is the word that is meant to teach us and to instruct us in righteousness. So Matthew begins by saying this. He says in verse 18, Now when Jesus saw the crowd around him, he gave orders to depart to the other side of the sea. Then a scribe came to him and said to him, Teacher, I I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus said to him, The foxes have holes. And the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Another of the disciples said to him, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, follow me and allow the dead to bury their own dead. This is the word of the Lord. Let us receive it as such. Let's bow together in prayer. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we have come and gathered recognizing that we are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. But we are to to join. We are to come together at times like these so that we might stir each other up to love and good deeds as we witness the person and work of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so, Father, we we ask that you would help us in this endeavor, that you would guide our hearts and minds so that we would see Jesus as he truly is and respond to him as we ought. So help us to apply this text, to give it the attention it deserves, not only now, but in the days and the weeks and the months to come. We pray this in Christ's most precious name. Amen. Thank you, brothers and sisters. Please be seated. As indicated earlier, our text involves three separate people groups. Uh, And beginning in verse 18, we are going to move in some ways from the general to the specific because it's here at the outset of, of our text that that, that Matthew draws our attention to the crowd. Jesus, or, or Matthew tells us that Jesus saw a crowd around him. And, and, and the Greek is actually a little bit more specific. Uh, most of our translations don't, don't capture it except for the, the New King James Version. Uh, what we find here is, in, in particular in the, in the Greek text, is that Jesus is not surrounded by a crowd, but by numerous crowds. Uh, He is surrounded by a great multitude, uh, by various groups of people who have come together from from all parts of the northern region and beyond. Uh, These people have gathered because of Jesus. Uh, Rumors have have spread concerning his bold teaching and, and his inexplicable acts. Uh, Miracles that defy expectation. Miracles that 
no one has ever seen or heard of. They have come more out of curiosity than conviction. They've come to see and hear these things for themselves. Reflecting on this grand assembly, Chuck Swindoll states the following. He says this. He says, in in my experience, crowds are sort of self-perpetuating. When they get large enough and reach critical mass, they develop their own gravitational pull. People first gather around some person or event, but then others gather simply because people are gathered. Sometimes people just want to be part of the action and to experience the excitement. They aren't necessarily convinced of the cause. We've seen that on the news lately, haven't we? I mean, we know there's all this unrest on the university campuses. There's all these protests that are going on. And so reporters are going into the fray. Uh, They want to discover the ins and outs of why people have gathered together. You know, what are the real issues that are involved? And, And so they'll pull out one of the activists and begin plying them with questions. And if that person is part of maybe the, the upper echelon of, uh, of, the, of the group, yeah, maybe they can give you a, a list of their demands, of, of what they're hoping to accomplish. But you just get the, the regular Joe, you, 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 you get Sally along and, and, yeah, we're here because everyone else is here. We're not exactly sure what's going on. We're, we're not sure when this is going to end. I don't know what the objective is. I just know it's about something along these lines, and and we're here. That's a good picture of what's happening in our text. These people have gathered around Jesus. Most of them have come for the show. Uh, They want to sit back and and enjoy the drama as Jesus spars with his, with his detractors and as he does the spectacular. They're just there to be part of the crowd. But as you and I know, Jesus has no interest in building his public profile. So much so that when he cleanses the leper and he sends him away, he he counsels him not to see anyone, not to stop. Don't tell anyone of what's happened. Just go immediately to the temple and and talk to the priest. Jesus is not interested in, in building up his fan club. He's not interested in in gaining followers for the sake of of celebrity. What Jesus wants is he wants true disciples. He wants those who will go to the ends of the earth, uh, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. And and so perhaps it's with that in mind that Jesus issues this command at this particular time. He tells his disciples to depart. Let's go to the other side of the sea. Let's not wait. I don't want this thing to get bigger than it already is. I I don't want more people to come. I want fewer. Let's depart. Let's go away. I mean, the move is calculated. It, It serves several purposes. We know that Jesus is both fully God and fully man, true God, true man. We know that he, as a human being, he needs rest. He needs time to recuperate because he has spent a, a massive amount of time ministering to these people. He's been up early in the day, late into the evening. Uh, the, 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 the knocks on the door have been incessant. They have not let up. So Jesus needs to get away to be recharged, physically speaking. Not only that, but he needs to to have some quality time with his true disciples so that he might equip them for the ministry that, that lies ahead, a ministry that we're going to see them partake of in chapter 10. But in doing so, As Jesus heads across the Sea of Galilee, this will have the effect of separating the groupies 
from the genuine. By making this journey, he will sift the, the fickle spectator from the faithful servant. So the principle here is clear. Those who follow the king cannot be content to remain on the periphery. They, they cannot sit on the sidelines and, and merely watch. Jesus is not interested in such people. Because his people have been called to do something. Uh, following Christ or, it entails a commitment. It requires effort and sometimes it requires great expense. We Yes, we are to be witnesses of Christ. But more than that, we, we are to be workers. Those who are willing to travel both near and far to tell others of what we have seen and heard. And so we must be active. Serving as Christ has called us to serve. And yet, even then, our labor needs to be rightly motivated. Our labor needs to be rightly motivated. We see this in verses 19 and 20. It's here that we are invited to consider the example of the scribe. Let's look at what the writer says. He says, A scribe came to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. What an interesting scene. I mean, picture this with me. Up to this point, Jesus has surrounded himself with a small band of fishermen. We know at least five of them right now. Uh, Peter, James, and John, uh, Andrew, uh, and I think Nathaniel is, is on the scene at this particular point in time. But now there's a teacher of the law that comes to Jesus. I mean, this, this is a group who has been and will continue to be a thorn in Jesus' side. A, a group that is constantly hostile to, to the things that he says and, and does. He, he is the polar opposite of those whom Jesus has called to himself. The fishermen are rough. They are smelly. This is a man of letters. Uh, this a man is a man who occupies the upper uh, echelons uh, of, of respected society. He is uh, an intellectual. He comes from the ivory tower. I mean, ever since the days of Ezra the scribe, these have been the, the official interpreters of the law of Moses. I mean, it's astounding that this man has come. That in some ways he has broken ranks with his fellow scribes and with the Pharisees. That this man would vow to follow Jesus wherever he goes. Yeah, it is an astounding statement we rarely see it in scripture even so there are a couple clues that are embedded within the text that suggest that something is off the first clue is the use of the title the scribe calls Jesus a teacher I mean that in and of itself is is a concession this man is a scribe. He's of the official guild, uh, those who are recognized by the, the larger society uh, as sitting in the seat of Moses. And, and yet th this scribe confers the same idea, the same title on Jesus himself. And yet as we read through Matthew's gospel, the five times that this term is used and applied to Jesus, it is always applied by someone who does not recognize his divine authority. Someone who does not recognize who Jesus truly is. Second thing that is, seems to indicate that something is off here is the statement itself. Uh, I mean, this is the first and only time, as far as I can tell, that an individual volunteers 
comes to Jesus and, and offers his service in this particular capacity. On all other occasions, Jesus himself initiates the contact. Jesus himself is the one who commands the individual to follow him. This is a complete reversal of that order. And lastly, perhaps most convincingly, is the response of Christ himself. Look at, look at what he says in verse 20. Jesus says, The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. On its own, this, this statement, it, it just seems disjointed, doesn't it? I mean, one doesn't s- simply, it, it just doesn't seem to follow after the other. It, it's nonsensical. Until we remember one thing. Jesus is God's eternal son. He shares all the attributes of his heavenly father. He is omniscient. He is omnipresent. He is omnipotent. So Jesus, knowing all things, is able to discern this man's inner thoughts. He he knows that this man has actually come with ulterior motives. And so he addresses that. See, by attaching himself to Jesus, this this man who is capable of drawing such large crowds, by attaching himself to Jesus, this scribe hopes to, to lend some credibility to the Lord's ministry. He is hoping then that as Jesus continues to grow in popularity and influence that he will be elevated by association. So the scribe is actually, has actually come seeking his own advancement. He's coming to, uh, looking for greater prominence and prestige. Uh, he wants to see his own name inscribed on the history books. And so it's in this light that Jesus' response, his rebuke, makes complete sense. You'll notice how Jesus identifies himself in this particular passage. He does not identify himself as a teacher, although that's what he does. No, he identifies himself as the Son of Man. This... This title will will occur at least 80 times in in the gospel narratives. Uh, It it is the third most popular designation of Christ within these texts. But it is the favorite self-descriptor that Jesus uses. It, It is his favorite way of referring to himself. I want you to understand where he gets this descriptor. It is found in the book of Daniel, verses uh, chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. If you have a moment, let's just flip over to Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. And, and just see how this term is used to, to understand to whom it is referring. Uh, if we were to go back uh, even just to verse 9. Uh, we, we see that we're put into a, a future context. Uh, it, Daniel says, I kept looking until thrones were set up in the ancient of days. God, the Father, took his seat. A- and his vesture w- was like white snow a- and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was ablaze with flames and, and wheels were a burning fire. A river of fire was flowing and coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands were attending him, and myriads and myriads were standing before him. The court sat, and the books were opened. Then dropping down to verse 13, Daniel continues to describe the scene. He says, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming, and he came up to the ancient of days, and he was presented before him, and to him the son of man was given dominion 
glory, and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. It's here that God's prophetic plan is presented in its most concise and compact form. Uh, This is the anchor uh, of Daniel's prophecy. Uh, This is the linchpin, really, of all prophetic literature. All of it uh, finds its source here. It flows into it and from it. This is the the, the great narrative of God's future plan. And it's here that, that we see that this Son of Man, this divine figure who, who rides in the clouds of heaven, that he will be given a, a, a kingdom or, or a dominion and glory and, and a kingdom by the ancient of days. Jesus is pointing to himself as this person. And being such a person, he does not need anyone to help him. He doesn't need anyone to give him credibility, to to salt his words with authority, to give him the power that he needs to do the things that he needs to do. No, he is the exalted one. He will have his kingdom because this is the Father's decree. Nevertheless, until that time, what Jesus tells us is is that the Son of Man will know little of man's creature comforts. Rather than enjoying the luxuries befitting his exalted station, he tells us that God's servant will, will wander from place to place depending on the charity of others. He won't, he won't even have his own home. And that's what we see with Jesus when he starts his public ministry. That's why we see him going to Peter's home. That's why we see him spending time with Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Because the Son of Man has less Less than all the creatures of his realm. Less than the birds of the air, less than the beasts of the field. He has no place to lay his head. In seeking to apply this text, many commentators have suggested that a disciple should count the cost before making a rash vow Uh, before seeking to become a disciple of Christ. Uh, They remind us that it's fairly easy to make profound claims, claims such as Peter did when he, you know, on the night of Jesus' betrayal, he called out to Jesus and said, "If even though all else, all others may fall away, I myself will never fall away. Yeah, that was a bold claim. We can all make bold claims. Ones that are very difficult to keep. And and while there is wisdom in in heeding this counsel, I don't think that's what Jesus is striking at in this particular passage. I think he has a deeper target in mind. I think he's actually speaking to our motives, to, to our reason for coming to him. I mean, are we following Christ because of who he is? Or, or are, we, are we following him because of what we seek to gain by such an alliance? Is this simply a, a utilitarian a, arrangement or real discipleship? If we come, as the scribe does, believing that we have something to offer and there's something for us to gain in the here and now, then I would suggest we do not understand who Jesus is or what he's calling us to do. See, Christ is the heart. He's the core. 
He's the sum and substance of Christianity. I, I mean, that's shocking, isn't it? So we don't come to Christ to make a name for ourselves. We, we come to Christ so that we might bow before the name which is above every other name. But we don't come for what we can get. We come in giving thanks because Christ has already given us everything on Calvary's cross to, to ransom us from sin and death and, and hell. But we do not follow him for, st- for the status we may enjoy because we know that we will be hated by all men on account of, uh, on account of him. That we will be insulted. We will be reviled. We will be ostracized for his sake. No, we come so that we might serve the one who sits on the highest throne in the highest heaven who seeks our highest good. We come because it's not about us. It's about Christ and Christ alone. In verses 21 and 22, Matthew shifts his reader's attention once again. Not only have we looked at the crowd, but we've looked at the scribe. Now we're going to focus our attention on someone who is simply identified as another disciple. Look at our passage. Matthew tells us, Another of his disciples said to him, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Follow me. Follow me and allow the dead to bury their own dead. Apparently, this individual has followed Jesus for some time. Uh, We don't know how long this connection has persisted. Uh, We don't know if he has followed Jesus as he has crisscrossed the the northern territories, if he has done this for a number of weeks or perhaps even a month or two. All, All we know is that this man is not a newbie. He has been with Christ for some time. He's seen the things that Christ has done. He's listened to the things that Christ has said. So much so that he is identified, at least, as a disciple. Even so, just as Jesus is about to depart and and to go to the other side of the sea, this individual approaches Jesus and asks for a general exemption, for some time off. He says he needs to attend to some personal matters, and so he wants to remain attached to Jesus, but but to do so without having to physically follow him at the current time. He specifically tells us that he wants to go and to, to bury his father before he rejoins the ranks. Once again, Jesus' response, let the dead bury their own dead, It sounds cold. It sounds perhaps even cruel to our modern ears. Until we understand, I think, the context in which this is said. Uh, We need to understand that this man's father is not dead. We need to understand that he's probably not even sick. If he were, it would be, it was, it would it's doubtful that this man would be here at this particular time uh, since the Jews generally buried the in, an individual on the same day that they died. I mean, we need to under, understand the Jews lived in a hot climate. They did not embalm their dead. And so when a, a loved one died, the mourning did not happen before the funeral. They were buried as soon as possible and you were allowed to mourn after. So what what is actually going on here? Why does Jesus respond the way he does? Well, it seems to be that this expression, you know, permit me to go and and bury my father, it it was a, a, a recognized euphemism of the day. It was a common way to declare one's intent to remain at home 
for the remainder of, of a parent's life, uh, a, a desire to remain there so that they could take care uh, of the family business and, and to ensure that funeral arrangements were made when the time came. This commitment often came with a financial incentive because one's inheritance could be lost or reduced if the individual did not fulfill their responsibilities to the family. So you need to understand what's going on here. This is a stalling tactic. One that could take years, if not decades, to, to work through. So Jesus, in effect, this man is saying to Jesus, Jesus, uh, allow me to hang back for a while. Uh, let me attend to the family business. Uh, once all the accounts have been settled, once the, the family business has been sold, once the, the inheritance has been allotted to all the family members, once the, you know, the kids are off to college, once I have you know, the time to do the things that I want to do, uh, once I've done that, after that, then, then I will come and follow you wherever you go. In saying this, we recognize that this man is placing his own comfort above the commands of Christ. So if this is the case, and indeed it is, how can we be surprised when Jesus answers as he does? I mean, he's forceful. He speaks directly to the issues. He never, he, he never whitewashes these things. No, he says, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. Jesus is calling for a true and total commitment. He is exhorting this man to make his priorities known. If he is going to be a, a real disciple, then Jesus has to have first place. He must be the focus. His concerns need to, be, need to, to arrive at the top of the list. He needs to dominate. If lesser things are going to compete with one's devotion to the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, then leave it to dead men. Leave it to the unregenerate to complete. Spurgeon, the Prince of Preachers, captures this idea as only he can. Writing in the, the 1800s, I mean, his words just apply equally to our age. This is what he said. He said, men who are unrenewed, unregenerate, are dead. And they are quite able to attend to such dead business as a funeral. Much of the concerns of politics, party tactics, committee meetings, social reforms, innocent amusements, and so forth, may be very fitly described as burying the dead. Much of this is very needful, proper, and commendable work. But still, only such a form of business as regenerate men can do as well as the disciple of Jesus. Let them do it. But if we are called to preach the gospel, and the reality is all of us are called to preach the gospel in our own individual context. If we are called to preach the gospel, let us give ourselves wholly to our sacred calling. Let not the higher worker entangle himself with what worldlings can do quite as well as he can. I think that's the right perspective. See, if we are to follow Christ, all of our cares and concerns must rightly be subordinated to the demands of our sovereign king. He must have the preeminence. We, we can't be like Augustine. When in his earlier days he prayed, Lord, give me chastity and continence, but not now. No, our response needs to be immediate. It needs to be unwavering. 
while we're not given to folly, to ill planning. There should be little hesitation. Why? Because as followers of Christ, we are to seek His kingdom and His righteousness first, recognizing that all that is needed will be added in due time by our Savior. So Matthew has given us today, he has given us three pictures, three portraits of what not to do when Christ commands our allegiance. The crowds, they sat back. Uh, They were content to be passive spectators. The scribe was too eager, too ambitious, failing to understand the the person and work of Christ. He, He wanted to press forward by aligning himself with Christ for his own sake, for his own personal advancement. The disciple was too timid, too tied to earthly concerns that he was unwilling to go when called. Where do you find yourself within the passage? Are you a watcher or a worker? Are are you one whose motives are perverted or pure? Are there temporal concerns that are holding you back? Are, Are you hesitating or are you marching forward confident that the one who possesses all power and all authority in heaven and earth, that he is able to take care of his own? Our our king has showed his hand. He's issued his command. He says, follow me. So the question is, will you obey? Will you respond to the king who demands our complete and total allegiance? Let's pray together. Father, we have come as servants who acknowledge their master's sovereignty, his right to rule over and dictate every aspect of our lives. We recognize that he is the creator and we are the creature. That he's the master. We are the slaves. And yet, Father, we also come knowing that we are faulty things. Knowing that we are not as committed or consistent as we ought to be. That we fall, that we stumble, that we are easily distracted. And so we pray that you would help us. Uh, Help us to to remember this text. Just drive it deep into our hearts and minds. We pray that your spirit would be active within us to recall these things as we go about our day-to-day responsibilities. Help us in those responsibilities to keep Christ first. Uh, To fix our eyes on the author and finisher of our faith. To, To toss away the the sin that so easily entangles, and to walk in the paths of righteousness for His sake. Help us to to display His glory and His grace in all that we say and do, so that when our journey in this life is over, we might stand before the throne and hear Him say, Well done good and faithful servant. Help us to be true disciples, not those who are disciples of name only. We pray this for our good and for His glory. Amen.